So I'm now going to go ahead and pass the floor to today's presenter, Dr. Michael Morchat. Take it away, Dr. Morchat. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, as Andy mentioned, this is uh, the fourth and final uh, presentation in our series. Uh, really, uh, if you're here since the first presentation, I've kind of uh, built on step by step, but I'm still going to review a few items that uh, are important. And uh, as Andy also mentioned, there is a handout that I provided, uh, so you can kind of follow along as well. It's just some of the important slides I find that you can reference later. later. Uh, so, like I said, this is the more advanced uh, pathology. Uh, last week, I, looked, I showed incidental findings, and as well as I showed um, a common, a common uh, uh, odontogenic findings, uh, peripical cysts, and today we're going to take it to the next level. Still some cysts, but some tumors in malignancies. So, just a, a quick review. Uh, this is you know, but very important because this is the views that you're going to see when you're uh, reviewing a, a cone beam CT. So, you're going to have the axial, which is parallel to the floor, coronal, which is going to be really good at looking at your maxillary sinuses, the airway, nasal cavity, that's going to be parallel to the front of the patient's face, and then finally the sagittal, which is left and right from the mid sagittal line. Uh, I don't want to come across like a salesperson, but this is what a report looks like. Uh, it's important to understand because this is really, I'm, I'm showing the progression of how you get from a description to an impression and then finally to a differential diagnosis. And that's exactly what the reports are built like as well. Uh, I'm a very visual person. I'm sure most uh, dentists are visual people. Uh, so I always make sure I leave enough, uh, uh, enough you know, uh, images, which is quite important. So right here is basically the meat and potatoes of the uh, reports. And so this is where the main description is going to be. Uh, this is something to reference back if there's something unclear at this bottom portion, which is the impressions and recommendations. Uh, this is what I call the actionable uh, area. You're not going to find something like uh, mucus retention pseudocysts, but you will see uh, items such as sinusitis or mucositis listed in this area. Uh, this is, like I said, this is the actionable part of the report. So again, I, this is in the in the handout. I don't. Want, I just want to touch on it again. You know, I already covered this uh, over the last two presentations. But really, it's important to understand how you get to a differential diagnosis or a diagnosis period. Uh, if you have yourself a really good description and image analysis, then that will lead you to an impression, and that impression should lead you in the right direction of what the uh, differential is. So here's the image analysis. Um, again, it's in the handouts, but the main areas and most important are the internal structure. Is it radio opaque, radio lucent, or high density, low density? What's the periphery? The periphery is is it corticated? Is it round? Um, the the biggest one is really the effect on the surrounding structure. So is there resorption? Is there tooth displacement? Uh, is there cortical expansion or interruption? All these items in the image analysis are going to lead us to the right direction and find out what that differential diagnosis or the diagnosis might be. And I really recommend that for maybe the next 10 patients that have unusual findings, print this page out, have it next to you, and refer to it for the first 10, uh, 10 patients, because after that, it'll just become automatic. So this is a really nice workflow. I really uh, like this. Uh, it really shows, you know, how you get to the impression. So again, with that different, uh, with the description, this is where you're going to start thinking: Is this a normal, you know, variation of anatomy, or is it, you know, abnormal? Uh, then going from there, is it a cyst? Is it benign neoplasm, a malignancy, inflammatory? Of course, the most common. Uh, but this is a really good workflow to, to, you know, uh, get you really thinking of uh, of where uh, the diagnosis might be. So, of course, this looks really messy. This is all the cysts that you, you know, can potentially have. Um, the one thing in radiology and probably some other medical fields uh, is lesions don't read textbooks. <clears throat> so, you, you might be a ridiculous cyst that's not perfectly at the apex, uh, but as long as you get a good, you know, description uh, and look at the main characteristics of your finding, then you will lead in this one direction. Uh, don't forget, a cyst, uh, has an epithelial lining. 
So if there's one at the apex, remember, this might not be uh, cured with an endodontic treatment, but you might have to open a window and curatage that, that cyst out. And so, like I said, these are the main characteristics of cysts. They're going to be well-defined. They're going to be corticated, most likely uh, low density. Uh, teeth are going to be involved, if it's odontogenic. Uh, and you can really find them anywhere uh, in, in the tooth-bearing area. Now, on the other side of the spectrum is now you have your neoplasm. So this is where you're going to have your benign or malignancies. And, of course, there's a lot of different type of tumors. And as you can see here, again, it's, it's a lot, a lot of information. The main ones uh, are going to be your hypoplasias and then your benign tumors. And benign tumors, odontogenic ones, uh, you're going to have the, the three main ones. So it's going to be either epithelial tumor, tumor uh, mesenchymal, or the mix. And, of course, the most common being your ameloblastoma. Uh, this is the main characteristics of what you're going to find with the tumor. Again, it's not absolutely 100% always going to be like this. You know, like I, I already said, uh, tumors and lesions, they don't read textbooks, but this is a general idea. Uh, when you're looking at a lesion, you're wondering what it is. If you have some of these characteristics, then you know you're going to be thinking more of something benign versus something that might be cystic or something that's a hyperplasia. <coughs> This is one of the main characteristics that you're going to find with, uh, with tumors. Uh, you're going to have more of displacement of structures. The cortical outline is going to be uh, displaced. The teeth are going to be displaced. The mandibular canal versus a cyst is just going to wrap around structures and wrap around the tooth. And then on the other side, from benign neoplasms or tumoral, going to something that's malignancy. Now, malignancy, you're going to have that stereotypical onion skin. That's the periosteal reaction. So the body is trying to protect itself and growing bone to, to contain uh, a structure. But malignancy, what it does, it just destroys everything. And that's always going to be the main findings with a the malignancy. There's just destruction. Okay, so how this week is going to work with the, with the cases and the questions, you're going to see the images and then you see what the potential answers are. But after I've done doing a quick little description, uh, Andy is going to put the poll on where you can select what it might be. So here, this is, we're going from simple to more difficult. So here we have a low density, corticated. Uh, it's surrounding the, the, uh, the crown of the tooth. There's slight displacements. The medieval canal does not appear to be involved. And so these are your possible answers. So Andy, if you can run the poll on this one, please. And again, I don't want you to put an answer and then think, oh, it's going to be wrong. There's also differential diagnosis, because I just noticed some, someone put uh, odontogenic keratosis. That's a great uh, diagnosis, but that CEJ to CEJ uh, uh, low density around the crown, that is, that's going to be your dentitor assist. But amyloblastoma and also uh, odontogenic keratosis are also very good uh, diagnosis, differential diagnosis. And it looks like most people, about 82% are saying dentitor assist, so that's great. Okay, so, one sec. There we go. So in this case, this is another really good incidental finding. What's incredible about this is the patient actually had really good dentition. Uh, they're going in for implants, and you look at the size of that, that's been there for a very long period of time. But it's round, corticated. The cross-section doesn't really show the apex of number nine. It's near the midline. So we can run the poll on this one. And again, nice and rounds. The incisive canal appears interrupted. 
Um, I know not everybody is familiar with the axial and, and coronal, but these are the best images that you can you can really get to to get a good representation of what it is. Again, people are all right. Maybe I made that too easy. Yes, incisive canal cyst. Um, the, the the apex, you can still see the cortical outline of the lamina dura of number nine. Uh, of, of course, we can't see the whole tooth. Uh, there was no resorption, but that, that's a, a, a great example of insect of canal cyst. And so just to describe, uh, you know, insect of canal cyst, this is a good example of another one that, that might have been missed. I'm not saying that a biopsy has to be performed right away uh, or any treatment, but anything that's over six millimeters for the insects of canal uh, I, should, I should say should be biopsied for incisive canal cyst. But here's another really great example of, of what you might find. So this one's a little bit more difficult. Uh, if you were watching the presentation uh, last week, I actually had this one um, uh, up. It is uh, uh, idiopathic osteosclerosis. But if you notice all around that mandible in the soft tissue, look at all that calcification and it's all squiggly worm-like. But we don't have a diagnosis for this, but it, that is some kind of calcification. So a, a diagnosis would be your fibrolis, list, uh, which you, will, you do find uh, uh, quite often. But definitely, you know, something to uh, you know follow up with the patient and have a, a record of, of those interesting findings is very important. Now, this one is a little bit more difficult. Um, again, uh, this, this is a really great case that was about just a month ago. Uh, all these cases are within the last uh, uh, four to six months uh, that I'm, I'm presenting. But what's Interesting about this, there's multiple possible answers, but there's a few clues to lead you to, you know, one diagnosis and then suggest other, uh, uh, other differential diagnoses. Uh, but this one, I'll describe it, low density, it's thinning, it's thinning that uh, lingual cortical plate. Uh, and I don't want to give, give the answer away, but the big hint here is the cortical outline of the mandibular canal is interrupted. So that's making you think that it has something to do with, uh, with that structure and not necessarily uh, have to do with the dentition. So if we can run the poll on this one, Andy. And again, low density, biggest hint was maneuver canals interrupted. And I'm telling you that again, we, you know, there, there was no biopsy, uh, and in this case, uh, you know, if, if, if we're going to hint at AB malformation, you don't want to do a biopsy. The patient's going to bleed out. Um, uh, that in hemangioma, you, you don't want to be uh, doing biopsies. They, they should be done in, in a hospital setting. Uh, but that's that's great. So many people got that AB malformation, and that's that's a really interesting find. Um, a second differential is, of course, you're going to be your odontogenic keratocyst. Uh, the big hint that it might potentially be that as well, other than the, the mandibular canal being interrupted, is that it's growing along the bone. And I'm going to show you that right now. The two main lesions that you're going to find most often, yeah, 50% AV malformation. That's awesome. This is the big difference. So with your ameloblastoma, you're going to have excessive expansion. Now, again, they both can be on, you know, differential diagnosis of, of each other, and they should be considered. But with ameloblastoma, you're going to have excessive expansion, um, and it just, it's just going to balloon out, and it's going to be the posterior part of the mandible most often. On the other hand, with ontogenic keratosis, it does expand a little bit, but not as much as uh, uh, ameloblastoma. And what you'll see is like you see in the mandible there with the odontogenic keratosis, it's growing along inside the bone. And it's going to have some resorption, and then you're also going to have interruption, uh, more interruption of the cortical outlines than you're going to see on ameloblastoma. So Dr. Morchat, we have a quick question. 
uh, just asking Absolutely. what the AV stands for and AV malformation. That's uh, artic uh, artery in, in vein, so uh, atrial ventricular malformation. But that's what AV stands for. Because what's happening is uh, the, the arteries and veins are crossing, and so there's, you know, there's a communication of blood between the two areas. But that's, that's what you're going to find there. This is a great case. Um, you know, a lot of these are incidental findings. Yes, some of them, you know, the, the dentist noticed and, and wanted, you know, to, to, you know, make sure if there was something wrong or not before referring to an oral surgeon. Uh, but this one was really interesting. Uh, area of concern was 32. And so it looks like a detector assist, but then look at what's going on with 17. That, that does not look right. It doesn't matter what kind of cyst or uh, rarefying osseitis, you're not going to see that kind of just exploding out of the buccal and lingual cortical plates. So this definitely, um, you know, incidental finding, you know, they, they probably uh, extract it, but now, you know, when you do the extraction, uh, there should also be a biopsy taken in this case. And then, of course, 32 has to come out. And based on the patient's age, uh, you might want to do a biopsy. Uh, older um, demographics and uh, older than tigger cysts can potentially be something more serious, uh, like a myeloblastoma or even a squamous cell carcinoma. This one's very interesting. Um, the, the high density makes you lean towards that, you know, it's, it's metal. It's not calcifications. Uh, in this case, uh, it was surgical, uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, staples. This is a really, really interesting case, uh, maybe a little bit more rare, but, uh, and again, I don't like playing the scare tactic, uh, but, you know, when a patient comes in and looking to extract their third molars and then number 18, um, and then you find something like this, and you're, you're going to be shocked. But this was an incidental find. I've, I've found, I've found, you know, quite often uh, malignancies or uh, serious Findings and, and again, I, I don't want to play the, the scare tactic that you, you have to, you know, send all your reports. But when you have a volume this size, there is a lot of uh, findings. Uh, really interesting about this one, if you noted, uh, is this a variation of anatomy or is this some kind of benign tumor? But it's it's basically just pushing all the bone uh, into the eth uh, ethmoid air cell. But the interesting part that makes you can potentially lean towards maybe a variation of anatomy. Look at the hypoplasia of the um, of the left sinus as well. It's a lot smaller. You know, uh, if this was a tumor, then you, it would be expanding in all directions. But here, you know, this this is your uh, lateral uh, or medial rectus of, of the eye potentially having something uh, associated with it. But as you can tell, it's it's, it's round. Uh, you know, there, there's no interruption that cortical outline. But the really interesting part is, you know, why is the maxillary uh, the left maxillary sinus also uh, uh, extremely small. So this one, uh, the uh, lower left, is actually is, is the lower right. This is a great case. Some people are going to get it right away or, or not, but uh, I didn't even know about this finding uh, until I went to, uh, you know, into radiology. But this is a great one. So, and again, there's always these one or two clues that really make you, make it a specific answer really stand out. This one, low density, it's almost crescent shape or round. Um, the, the big giveaway, and again, I, I don't want to say something that's just going to give you the answer, uh, but the biggest finding on this one, it's below the manipular canal. So Andy, if you want to run this poll. Yeah. 
when I made this presentation, this was, I'm going to say, my favorite uh, slide to see what people's answers are on this one. Wow, I'm really shocked. But yeah, almost all of you are totally correct. Um, that is a staffing defect. Over 70% of people uh, got that, that answer correct. It's not very common, but when you see it, you might think something cystic, but uh, uh, staphne defect, what it is, is actually your lingual uh, salivary gland just makes an indentation into the mandible. And totally benign. No reason to biopsy, no reason to uh, uh, anything. This one, of course, this is not an incidental finding. Uh, patient came in, they took the scan, they saw it. Um, again, a few little hints that give away the answer. So this is multilocular, uh, low density, in the anterior mandible. And this, two huge findings. Number one, look at the absorption of that tooth. And two, note the patient's age. You know, again, if Andy, if you want to run this poll, you know, there, there's so many, you know, we're, it's, Radiology is like detective work. Usually it's just a time stamp uh, in time. You know, it, it's, you only see what it is today. You didn't see what it looked like before or how it grew. But the big giveaways on this one is patient's age and resorption. That leads you to a differential. Again, you wouldn't rule out the other findings or the other uh, differential diagnoses uh, because it could potentially be something else. Now this is a real tough one, like this is advanced radiology, but those who did CGCG, absolutely. And again, because of the patient's age, you can't rule out amyloblastoma, but you wouldn't really you know, lean so much to uh, squamous cell carcinoma or OKC, uh, because you know, number one, you do have that expansion and uh, you do have that resorption. But that's, that's, I'm really impressed, because that, again, that's advanced. Uh, Definitely diagnosis. We, we have a question asking exactly how old that patient was. Well, you're just looking, you know, they have their third molars. So you're, you're, in, you're, you're in your 20s. I, I'm going to say between 20 and 30. I don't have the exact answer to that. But I actually, I, I, I can look that up and add it to another presentation. So here's a good one. Area of interest, they want to plan, plan for implants uh, in the uh, maxilla. And again, the reconstructive panoramic, a panoramic is not going to show, you know, with such clarity of what's going on here. And again, now, now you're helping the patient because you don't want to scare the patient, be like, oh, what the heck is that? Send them to oral surgeon. I don't want to say waste their time, but, you know, get them scared, having them more, you know, it, it, how many people have uh, dental anxiety and now, you know, they're, they're in a chair at oral surgeons uh, also finding out what's going on here versus take a cone beam CT and, and you can see so much information here. So, Andy, if you want to run this one, but what, you, what you're looking at is uh, irregular high densities with uh, uh, low density rim. Uh, the bone around it is not sclerotic. The trabecular bone pattern appears within normal limits. Uh, there is definitely expansion of the buccal cortical plates. So this is a really good one. I'm actually really surprised at the answer because at first glance, I would lean more towards osteodysplasia, but 
you, you guys are great detectives because you don't see the lamina dura. You know, it's continuous with the apex of, of the, uh, the roots. So that's, that's a great one. So yeah, 70%, I would definitely lean that way as well. All right, I had this in the presentation last week. Let's see if people remember, um, you know, I don't have such perfect, clear examples of this. Um, you know, most of the time, they're a little bit more ambiguous, but this one, it just, it screamed uh, the diagnosis on this one. But here you have uh, a small amount of expansion. You have a lot of bone destruction, destruction. You have that soft tissue component that you can see that's just mesial to the, to the 32. But you can see this, it, this, the bone just being eaten away. Mandibular canal, you came and trace it. Andy, do you want to run this one? And again, you know, the people that are putting meloblastoma, is that possible? Yes. You would probably want to say squamous cell carcinoma first, again, because the absolute, dis, you know, destruction of the bone uh, and the soft tissue components. Uh, but meloblastoma, the, the one or two findings that I don't see here is you don't see a lot of expansion. And, and like I mentioned, at meloblastoma, there's going to be a, a significant amount of uh, expansion of the cortical bone. Those are really good answers. And we got, yeah, about 70% of people saying squamous cell carcinoma. All right, this one, I don't even know what it is. Uh, patient can't get a biopsy. Uh, this is actually just, uh, I followed up with this patient over two year period uh, at the university. Um, I was lucky enough that they had still paper charts of hers. Um, and uh, if you want to make a guess, but the giveaway was that's bone graft. You can see how sclerotic the bone is there. They, she had severely pneumatized max, uh, maxillary sinuses. And you got to think of how pneumatized it was uh, that uh, it's going all the way to 11. Uh, but she wanted a, an implant in, in number 12. Uh, why we couldn't get a biopsy or I had to just follow up radiographically uh, is because she had uncontrolled uh, diabetes. But that's a real interesting one. Uh, this, that, that graph material was placed about 15 years ago. And so uh, the osseous integration somehow, uh, you know, it, it, it got into that periodontal ligament space. The tooth is still completely vital. Uh, but really interesting find, finding. And again, you know, I followed up with her a year or a year and a half after we found it, uh, you know, in, in hopes to, you know, get a biopsy. Uh, but um, there was no change. And again, the tooth was still vital. So that's a really interesting case. This one was actually incidental finding. A great colleague of mine here in San Antonio. She works at the hospital. Um, you know, patient comes in to do her checkup. She was actually from uh, South America. I don't don't ask me exactly what, what country, but she didn't speak English or Spanish, and so they had a real hard time communicating with her. Uh, she didn't mention anything of getting radiation therapy, uh, but look look at that junk in the mandibular canal. I uh, in, in the, uh, the the condyles on the right side. And you can actually even see uh, if you have if you're watching looking at it on a computer, you might not see it on a, a cell phone, but you see there's a pathological a uh, fracture, uh, you can see that stepping uh, appearance of the bone. I'm really curious what people think about this one. Another really interesting case, uh, I, I found it at the dental school, uh, patient didn't say, you know, I don't want to give it away, but that she had any surgery uh, until, you know, we, we saw this and, and asked her, 
you know, what it might be. Uh, should we just get an implant in the area and look at all that? If some people can uh, type in an answer in, in, the, uh, in the chat box, I'm really curious what some answers might be. If you've ever seen this before. We have one guess for an onlay bone graft. That's interesting. I actually never considered that, but no, that was not a really good, good, that's a really good answer. I'd even consider that. We have answers. But that's actually, uh, go ahead, Andy. More answers for bone graft, shotgun to the face, cheek implant, facial fillers, dermal filler, silicone injection. Yeah. It, it was Restylin or Restyline. I'm not sure exactly the pronunciation, but that actually is really cool. But that's, you know, very close to after um, they, they do the, the, the implant or the, the filler material. Uh, that's what it looks like. But I'm telling you, when I saw it, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> what could that be? And she finally admitted to it to uh, um, uh, filler material or Restylin. Really interesting case. Um, big finding on this one. Look at the patient's age. What, what is that? They're 10, between 10 and 12. Uh, this one's shocking. The, the cortical outline of the maxillary sinus was completely intact. Uh, so, how the heck it got there? Uh, you gotta imagine the automedial complex is not that large, um, but uh, that's a solid piece of metal. Uh, and what's really crazy about it, and I, I shouldn't laugh, but there was no soft tissue thickening. It, that's absolutely loose in the patient's head. So you gotta imagine if they shook their head, you know, they, they would actually probably hear rattling. But that was, that was a really shock, uh, shocking find. Well, I'm sorry, I, I think I went a little too fast on the questions. Uh, because that's actually it. So if we have any questions uh, that anyone has. We have some questions previously. Um, earlier on when we were doing the polls, we have a question for how do you distinguish between cemental osseous dysplasia and cemental blastoma? Cemental osseous dysplasia versus uh, cemental blastoma. Um, so you're going to have, or, or cemental hypoplasia is, is, it's going to be connected to the root. Osseous dysplasia, it's, you know, they're very, very close in diagnosis, uh, but uh, uh, cemental osseous dysplasia, it will have a soft tissue, or, or it'll have it in, almost like an encapsulation. It's going to be corticated with a, a low density rim and then an irregular uh, high density within. Now, the big thing about osseous dysplasia, it will vary depending on when, uh, uh, when it occurred or when it started growing because it can be anything from a low density uh, all the way up to you know, extremely, extremely dense, uh, but it's gonna be independent of the uh, uh, apex of the root. You gotta imagine cemental blastoma, it's, it's gonna be connected to, um, uh, to the tooth itself. A good point. Oh, we and actually... actually I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Morchat. No, that was, that was about it. So we just had some questions uh, wanting to clarify that, that previous patient. So was that um, just metal in the sinus from uh, something going up the adolescent's nose, or is it pathology? Or that's, It's too high dense to be pathology. It definitely, the patient is very young, was shot. Big, again, like the, they're already... You know how how old are they here? Um, the the other finding is that other high density that you can kind of see in in the nasal cavity, uh, but that's something that the patient uh, you know somehow got uh, got up inside their their nose. Uh, if, uh, if you know they were shots, you know it's going to be a BB because you know a shot to the face is probably going to you know do a little bit more damage than that. And also the the, the cortical outline was continuous 
I'm not saying that bone doesn't heal, you know, it's possible, but there might be some other uh, evidence. We have a question for uh, what does CGCG stand for? CGCG, so that's central giant cell granuloma. And that's normally, it's going to be a younger patient. Uh, the char other characteristics, it's normally in the anterior of the, the mandible, uh, most often finding, but it's still going to have that, you know, like a, 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 a adoptogenic keratosis or amyloblastoma. It's, it's still going to have that kind of wispy, multilocular appearance, uh, but normally they're going to be about that size. Um, in the patient you showed with the filler, we have a question about how did the filler lead to a pathological fracture on the, of the condyle? Um, they're commenting that there was no osseous pathology uh, in the edentulous case. We just want some clarification. Okay, so th these are two different patients. Um, that's the filler material. And this, as you can see in the condyle, that's, that's uh, osteomyelitis. Um, so, and, and it's necrosis and osteomyelitis, and that's where you're going to see the, the variation. Uh, you know, the bone is growing uh, to protect itself, but it's also getting destroyed or dying, you should say. But those are two different cases. But, you know, here you can see um, the osteomyelitis is the, the reason that the, the bone fractured because it's just, there's no, you know, it, it's, it's dying, it's dead, it's dying. And so that's, that's a common finding, the uh, uh, pathologic fracture, especially in uh, edentulous patients. So the follow-up question is, um, that filler material, where exactly was it located? In the cheek? That's in the cheek, yes. Yeah. That, that's why, I, I'm sorry, yeah, because I, I know I'm familiar with looking at them all, all the time, but as you can see here, I'm just going to grab the mouth for a second. This is, these are coronal views. Uh, so here's the maxillary sinus, here's the nasal cavity, um, and so it, it, it was right on the cheek. And that was, that was the size of the volume. We, we didn't do a full head scan, we just did the area of interest. Uh, I think it was a Merida, uh, six by six. We have another question asking if you could explain that onion skin reaction in more detail, and if you uh, happen to have any actual imaging of that finding. Uh, the best I have is just, let me go back. It was a little further back than I thought. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, these are, these are the characteristics that you're going to find with malignancies. Um, other lesions can cause that onion skin look, but it's going to have that onion skin. So as you can see, uh, the third picture down, that, that's the periosteal reaction. So the bone is trying to protect itself. Now, what made this onion skin appearance, there's other lesions, I, I think hemangioma, I, I would have to review, you know, like um, double check that there are other le uh, lesions that cause that, but we have the onion skin with bone destruction, that's gonna be your malignancy. And so the, the four main, you see that uh, sun ray appearance, that definitely is, uh, hemangioma will cause that uh, sun ray appearance. Uh, the Codman's triangle, that's where uh, it's no longer parallel. It's just it basically just the bones being blown out. Uh, and then cortical destruction, that, that's just, you know, it's stereotypical that there's, there's that much destruction of the bone. But basically, it's your so periosteum of the bone. The outer layer is what's uh, growing, again, growing to protect itself. Uh, but then at the same time, it's getting destroyed. But that's that's where the onion skin comes from. So we have a couple of comments just saying um, Gary's osteomyelitis causes the onion skin appearance. Um, and, some, and asking for some elaboration on Codman's triangle. Okay, uh, Codman's triangle, basically that's where you just see it is an acute angle. Instead of, you know, if there's a cyst or... Uh, other uh, pathology, you're not going to have that acute angle of, of the cortical outline, uh, but that's what the Codman's triangle is. 
and yes, whoever said uh, osteomyelitis, that's correct. That, that would be another one that, that causes the uh, um, onion skin appearance. Awesome. So we have another question. Um, this doctor asked, can you explain how you generally report maxillary sinus disease? For instance, um, a mucosity versus extensive filling of the sinus. Okay, so yeah, uh, that's, that's a really good question. So the, the findings that I will look for when there's, you know, and we'll, we'll call it, you know, a pacification of the sinus, uh, if, if there's a basically like a fluid level, uh, it's going to be more flat versus uh, uh, mucus retention pseudocyst is going to have that dome shape coming from, you know, wall or the floor of the maxillary sinus. Uh, sinusitis or mucositis, you can imagine it, it is a fluid, so it's just going to be more flat. Uh, if you see on the surface or within it what's called air inclusions, that's a, a, a heading more towards like a, a acute active uh, sinusitis. If the cortical outlines of the uh, maxillary sinuses start being thickened or sclerotic, that's where you're starting to look at something that uh, is more uh, chronic. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would still put all of those descriptions in the description portion of a report, but then I would not report in the incidental uh, or the uh, uh, impressions or recommendations, I would not put that mucus retention pseudocyst. A mucus retention pseudocyst, you, you take an x-ray today and then uh, one a few days later and it may be there, might be gone. Um, if it's so large that it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, blocking the uh, osteomyelial complex, then that's something more to be, you know, concerned about and to, to follow up. So for questions five, six, and seven, I think you kind of got into a role and you were like, hey, um, awesome. It looks like most people got the right answers, but um, I was getting a lot of questions from the audience because they actually can't view the answer choices or the answer spread like we can. So if you could just quickly review the correct answers uh, for questions five, six, and seven for the attendees. That's one. Oh, I see. Sorry, my little window is blocking what question number they are. There we go. Um, Again, you know, like I, I want to keep on mentioning that we don't, there, there was no biopsy, so we don't know 100% what the answer is, but I, I keep on mentioning that there's some clues that lead you one direction versus another. The CGCG or central giant cell granuloma, um, which I think most people did get this one correct, uh, it's going to be anterior to the mandible, and it's going to be a younger patient. Your odontogenic keratosis. You know, the, the patient might be a little bit older. It's going to be just like amyloblastoma. It's going to be in posterior parts um, of the uh, mandible, most likely. You know, again, you know, I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, but like I said, you know, it's a joke in the radiology uh, field. You know, lesions don't read textbooks. Um, but the big giveaways on this one, uh, CGCG or central giant cell, um, is uh, uh, it being in the anterior mandible and the resorption without a lot of expansion. So those few little clues lead you to that answer. Uh, number six, um, idiopathic osteosclerosis, you're not going to have a low density rim. Osteosysplasia is definitely a really good uh, secondary um, diagnosis. If you look on the uh, second image on the bottom, you know, that doesn't look like it's associated with the tooth, so that would be, uh, you know, lead towards that uh, answer, the osteo, uh, idiopathic osteosclerosis, excuse me, osteosysplasia. Idiopathic osteosclerosis is not going to have a low-density rim. It's going to be mixed with the, the bone around it, and the surrounding bone is not going to be sclerotic. Um, and then a cementoblastoma, that's really, it's going to be associated with, uh, or hyperplastic cementum, uh, is going to be associated with the, the apex of the tooth. Um, and then this one, that, that was, okay, seven. So uh, this one, 
CGCG. Most likely, it's going to be in the anterior mandible. Uh, odontogenic keratosis, that's a good uh, differential because uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, the, the bone being uh, destroyed, but also interruption of the cortical outline. Amyloblastoma, correct area, but not necessarily because there's going to, there's going to be a lot more expansion of the uh, cortical outlines of the, the bone. Um, but also a good answer because most likely mural amyloblastoma is going to be associated with a tooth, uh, most often impacted. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma, this is the most likely answer uh, because of the destruction, uh, because of the soft tissue component you can see in the uh, far right image, uh, just anterior to the, the tooth. Uh, but those are the, the answers for that one. Awesome. Thank you so much for that review. Um, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, one is, in the patient with osteomyelitis, do you sus uh, suspect a more systematic pathology, perhaps osteopetrosis? Uh, you know, uh, that's a possible differential diagnosis. Um, you know, again, you know, this, this came to me from, you know, a, a, a hospital here uh, in town, and uh, that was kind of uh, where they're leading that it, they they might have because I of course I followed up with the, the doctor because you know anything that's this severe you want to get the report out as quick as possible uh, that is a possibility secondary diagnosis uh, but uh, Dr. Robo was really uh, you know thinking that uh, this would this was a, a necrosis from radiation th therapy because you can also see uh, it's it's not just in the condyle I went over this a little quickly uh, but you can also see on the uh, right. Uh, posterior part of the maxilla, uh, there's something going on there as well. A good answer. So back to the patient with the filler material, we have a question if it could possibly be uh, theololith formation. That, that's, that's also possible. Um, but, you, you know, this, not all the patients did I have interaction with them? You understand? Like I, um, I will work in the clinic, you know, press the button for the the patients, uh, and then also work, you know, at, at a computer in a dark room where I get, you know, uh, volumes, you know, from all over the United States and Canada. Um, but this one, because you know, I did see the patients, uh, that that that's what we knew. It was it was wrestling or wrestling, however you pronounce it. We were able to follow up with this patient. But it's a good answer. So we have a question uh, for the left maxillary sinus case. Um, was the diagnosis ultimately anatomical variation? Uh, are we talking about this one? Oh, the left. This this is that was a really cool case that just came. I'm going to say not well. I'm going to say a month ago. This one here. I can't give you 100% diagnosis on this one. Again, we can lead in one direction, um, and you know it, it's a very interesting finding because you know the the dentist has to make this decision at this point you know, to follow up, uh, refer them, find a little bit more medical history. Um, but that smaller hypoplastic sinus is definitely, you know, variation anatomy. Uh, you can get what's called a smaller maxillary sinus uh, if there's a patient has what's called silent sinus syndrome. Uh, but you're also going to see the uh, cortical outline being a little bit more thickened. Um, but yes, this, this looks like a variation of anatomy. And that's why I'm thinking in this case, it might not be as serious as one would think right away because you can still see the cortical outline uh, of the ethmoid air cells. Um, this, the, the two playing together, uh, you'd lean to, you know, not to scare the patient in my mind. That's, that's what I always try to do. You know, I try to be, uh, you know, diplomatic in my, in my reports so that, you know, you, you see it, you read it, and it's not like, oh my goodness, you know, we got to scare the patient. I'm, I'm giving options. Um, you know, a differential diagnosis that this potentially could be um, uh, variation of anatomy. 
but it, it to me it, just, it seems too round. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is a really interesting case. I've never seen anything like that. And I, I don't know what kind of tumor would cause just perfect, almost round or oval shaped expansion and just push all the walls of the maxillary sinus uh, immediately. Uh, I should, sorry, ma not maxillary sinus, ethmoid air cells. So we have quite a few comments coming in now that you have this slide up. Uh, we have a suggestion for inverting uh, papilloma. Um, what about previous fracture of the medial orbital wall? Um, is there some pathology impinging into the ethmoid sinuses? Um, someone noted that there is some atherosclerosis in the axial slice. Yeah, those are all really good options. Um, you, you know, again, you know, the, the, the whole point is, I shouldn't say the whole point. When, when I see something like this, I don't want to write a report and then scare the, the patient uh, or scare the doctor. And, you know, I, I want to give them something that they, they can work with and not be like, oh, look what I found. And that, that's it. You know, so I, you know, look at the volume. I try to, you know, use all the pieces that we have here. You know, again, you know, the, the maxillary sinus is, is slightly smaller. Uh, you know, it, it seems like such a, you know, nice dome-shaped uh, inverted papilloma. You know, it's possible. Uh, the only thing is I really do see uh, the well, wall of the, of, the, uh, ethmoid air cell, uh, of the ethmoid air cells. They can see that, you know, it's, being, it's coming from the orbit, it appears. Um, you know, but those are all really good. Uh, differential diagnosis, absolutely. All right, and then in an unrelated question, uh, we have a doctor asking, are Hounsfield units applicable in CBCT as in traditional CT in assessing, uh, assessing bone quality, particularly in um, assessing an implant site? No, um, that is the big difference. Um, th there's multiple before, you know, pre-patient, post-patient uh, screens that adjust uh, the, the, the dose and the radiation when it comes to uh, the traditional CT or, or multi-detector uh, CT. It's not, it's, it's MD-CT because multi-detector um, or helical, uh, but no, Hounsfield units, you know, you're going to see some software that's going to uh, allow you to play with the Hounsfield, but it's, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it's just like a, a Algorithm to you know manipulate the um, uh, the the contrast and brightness. Um, of course, you know you can manipulate those really well to see better a bone, uh, but you're never really going to see much soft tissue. All the soft tissue is is you know that soft tissue density. Uh, that's why in this image, you know you can't tell um, if there is a tumor in there, and if there is, you know it's a soft tissue density. But the, the uh, manipulation of, of Hounsfield units is, it's not, it doesn't work with the uh, cone beam CT. Yeah, and um, I'll kind of comment on that from the, from the guided surgery side as well is, um, at least with current CBCT technology, it's not um, really an exact value that you can, that we've seen that you can make a basis off of. It's really more comparative. So the Hounsfield unit is useful if you're trying to compare the density of one area versus another, but to say, you know, look at this bone, if it falls within this range, that's great for, for implants, um, you know, stability and integration. I mean, it's, it's just not there yet, at least with today's CBCT. So, um, 